Are you thinking of hiking somewhere new and wondering how to get properly prepared and get started? Here's my top five things to research before hiking in a new country. Let's go. Hello long distance hikers and long term world travellers, Russ here bringing you the best tips and inspiration for hiking around the world. Okay so the first thing that you need to research is visas and the length of time that your visa needs to be and versus the length of time for your hike. For instance for the PCT it would be very good if us from the UK were also US nationals but we're not so we're going to need the right visa for a three to six month trip. For the PCT and the US visa, you're going to need a B2 type tourism visa and that will last you about 180 days. Some other countries that I've been to, you do get a visa on arrival and some other countries you need to book your visa and get it prepared for before you even get your flight out of your home country. For countries like Indonesia, you do get a 30 day visa on arrival. Uh, for countries like Nepal, you have to, uh, when you arrive at the airport in Kathmandu, you have to pay for a visa. I think it's about $20 uh, as soon as you get there in the airport and they sort it out there for you. Other countries uh, you do need to apply for your visa before your flight especially for countries like India uh, you have to go online and it's something ridiculous like 150 quid something like that uh, but yeah Southeast Asia is a bit of a hit and miss one but for countries in Europe and countries like the USA you definitely need to get your visa sorted before you go so do check that out. It can be a bit of a tough one to get organized and uh, planning it against your hike especially if it's a long distance through hike but once you've got it sorted as well as your permits you're good to go. Okay so the second thing to research before hiking in a new country is what the hiking culture is like in that country that you're going to. So with Nepal you've got Everest Base Camp Trek, you've got the Annapurna Circuit, you've got the Himalayan Mountain Range. It's pretty obvious that the culture around hiking is going to be huge in Nepal. It's basically one of the biggest things that their economy is thriving on right now. On the flip side you've got hiking in China which is bordering with Nepal uh, and you usually can actually hike to Everest Summit from the Tibetan side but uh, in recent months uh, I think they've actually stopped all the trekking to Everest Summit and around that area on the Chinese side due to the amount of rubbish in the area. So yeah do a little bit of research before you go, check the news, check the articles online, check the newspapers if you can and you should get the most current and up to date information about the culture and the rules and regulations about hiking in that country before you go. In Indonesia where I've spent a lot of my time trekking the culture mainly revolves around volcano trekking and jungle trekking. A lot of the places in Indonesia especially places like Bali uh, and Lombok a lot of the trekking revolves around tourism so you're guaranteed it's going to be busy no matter what time of year uh, the thing with volcanoes is obviously they can be uh, closed off due to eruptions and things like that so it's good to check out those things before you go to a place like Indonesia as well another thing about Indonesia is that the volcano trekking is run by unofficial uh, companies or uh, organizations that live in the surrounding areas around the volcanoes uh, they're not government run like I said they're not official they're just a bunch of people trying to make some coin out of you the traveler and they will pigeonhole you into getting a guide to take you up the trek. When I went to uh, Mount Batur in Bali that was last year uh, I kind of got funneled into having a guide with me. Uh, the guide was probably about 16 years old and any old Joe could have walked up that volcano without a guide it was a really clear path so if you go you will find that you will have no problem with walking up there by yourself uh, but the thing is because it's run by these kind of unofficial organizations uh, it's best to just get the guide, pay the money and you'll be a lot safer for it. I've heard stories of people getting kind of mugged uh, because they're hiking up the volcano on their own and they insist not taking a guide and paying the money but the locals don't like that uh, so take my advice if you go there definitely do pay the 20 pounds or something whatever it is uh, before you go up there and get the guide you'll just have a good trip if you really want to see that sunrise uh, on the volcano. So yeah Indonesia is a funny one with the trekking and it's very touristic uh, but it's so so beautiful and definitely worth it if you can just see past those little issues. In parts of the world like Southeast Asia it's very very unlikely that you're going to be uh, able to hike on your own and camp in really random places on your own it's just not like that they're very overpopulated areas especially on the little islands of Indonesia uh, I didn't feel comfortable wild camping in those places plus it's hot and sweaty and all of these little things that just kind of deterred me from doing that uh, so yeah um, do your bit of research before you go about the culture 
temperatures of these places. Uh, and when you're there, you'll actually get a good feel of uh, what it's like to actually camp and hike in these places anyway. So for, for me, the best thing is just dropping in there and finding out, but uh, I do wish I did a bit more research before I went instead of just thinking, yeah, I'm gonna be able to hike from one end of Bali to the other, because it's, it's very, very difficult to do so. Okay, so the third thing to research before hiking in a new country is uh, to look into whether the country actually offers the type of trekking that you're looking to do. For instance, like I just said, I went to Bali and I thought, ah, oh, there must be a route out in Bali where I can hike either around the entire island or up through the middle of the island and over the volcanoes. And I was speaking to my friend Wyan and he said, literally, like, there are these really ancient routes out in Bali where hunters used to use the trails to, to obviously go hunting, uh, but they're just not used anymore or they're overgrown. A lot of the time in the islands of Indonesia, uh, you just can't um, find a one fixed route that goes all the way from one end to the other. Um, like there's things like really deep cavernous gorges that are just thick with jungle. Uh, you'll be doing a lot of bushwhacking. It would be really nice if you could hike from one end of the island of Bali to the other, uh, but it literally is almost damn near impossible to do that. Whereas if you went to a country like the US or a few of the countries in Europe, there are plenty of well-maintained hiking trails that are specifically for long distance hiking. All this research uh, into what type of trekking the country actually has to offer will actually enable you to manage your expectations about what kind of trekking you're going to be doing there. When I went out to Indonesia last year, I was really hoping to do some extra long distance trekking, uh, but when I got there and figured out that it wasn't that simple, uh, I was a little bit disappointed. So uh, yeah, managing your expectations is what that's all about. Okay, so the fourth thing for you to research before hiking in a new country is the quality of the gear out there and what type of hiking and trekking gear they actually have to offer out there. Okay, so in Nepal, if you're going on the Everest Base Camp Trek or any trekking in the Himalayas, uh, the best place to go to is Tamel. Uh, it's best off to stay there. There's plenty of trekking shops and restaurants and things like that. Uh, loads of hiking clubs and uh, places where you can book some trekking. Uh, loads of trekking companies that you can do that through and get all your permits sorted. But the big problem uh, with buying trekking gear in Nepal is if you go into those shops in Tamel, a lot of the trekking gear is of a very low quality. They're probably gonna be pretty cheap knockoffs. Uh, when I went out there, I really needed a new pair of shoes because my New Balance Minimus just weren't gonna be enough for the Everest Base Camp Trek. And I was very, very lucky to find a very good pair of La Sportiva Tempestas. But I would say nine times out of 10, the trekking gear that you buy in Tamel in Kathmandu is gonna be very low quality. Also very, very important that while you're looking for gear and purchasing things in Tamel, for your Everest Base Camp trek or any trekking in the Himalayas that you uh, haggle right down to at least 25% below the asking price. Uh, most of the time they're gonna shoot high for the prices anyway. For me, I was in a bit of a rush when I was in Tamel and I didn't do that and maybe I could have saved myself about 50 quid on the asking price, but at least I got the gear that I wanted. What I would do with Nepal, especially when you're buying trekking gear, is make sure that you have your big three, which is your tent, your backpack, your sleeping bag, as well as your shoes all ready to go. So uh, make sure that you buy them when you're back home because uh, you know then you've got the official high quality gear on your back and on your feet. So that was Nepal. Indonesia was actually my first stop last year and what I wanted to do was bring all of my gear in my uh, HMG backpack and have it all to be able to put into the overhead compartment on the plane. So uh, that meant I couldn't bring my tent stakes with me. They won't allow those on a plane with you. Uh, I couldn't bring my camping stove fuel because they wouldn't obviously allow me to bring that into the cabin. They wouldn't even allow you to stow that underneath in the uh, in the cargo bay of the plane. So I had to leave a few things behind and I was pretty naive in thinking that I'd be able to go out to Indonesia. There's all of these places to trek up volcanoes and surely people must camp and have camping stoves and use tents a lot. And when I went out there, um, I asked my friend Wyan if it was possible to take me around the main town in Bali and see if we could look for some trekking shops. And the big problem with that is every single trekking shop that we went into was only focused on a few tents, a few sleeping bags, shoes, uh, things like really cheap backpacks are really, really popular out there. So you go into these trekking shops in Bali and they literally have nothing for ultralight backpacking. I literally uh, can't uh, describe how sparse it was. So I'd go into these trekking shops uh, in Denpasar in Bali and I'd show them a picture of the camping stove gas that I needed. All of them said no, that none of them had uh, the right fuel, none of them had tent stakes. 
that you could buy separately. Uh, if you wanted tent stakes in all of the trekking shops in Bali, you actually had to buy a tent with it. So it was a real, real big pain. My absolute last resort to find stove gas in Bali uh, was that I went online and I found this, what looked like a little shop that possibly sold uh, kind of handmade stoves. And there was a picture of all of this stove gas behind the counter in the shop. Uh, and we got on our moped and we drove all the way there. It took us about an hour to get there. And we turned up and literally all it was was some dude uh, who was selling these makeshift kind of uh, stoves that were kind of different parts taken out of larger big camping stoves that he'd kind of modified. I looked at this thing and the quality was so bad I thought if I put some stove gas in this and light it up it's gonna just explode uh, and at the end of the conversation which lasted about half an hour trying to explain that I needed to buy this thing uh, it turned out that he was only renting them for about two or three days at a time so uh, that was probably the worst uh, experience of trying to buy trekking gear in another country that I've ever had. So if you are going trekking in Indonesia, uh, it's worth just having a separate bag that you're gonna stow away underneath the, in the cargo bay of the plane, and at least then you'll have your tent stakes. If you're not too fussed about having a camping stove uh, and you don't mind checking in a bag, the last resort that I came up with for buying tent stakes was actually going to a, uh, a workshop and having them get some rods of metal and making my own. It literally cost me about 50p to get eight tent stakes made. The problem is they weighed an absolute ton. And uh, in the end, I didn't even uh, use them because the, the possibility of me actually being able to hike somewhere and camp somewhere like wild camping in Bali was just almost damn near impossible, like I said earlier. Okay, the fifth and final thing that you guys need to research before you go hiking in a new country is the type of trekking that you're going to be doing versus the jabs that you're going to need. If you're going trekking in different countries, uh, it's very important to research this uh, because the types of jabs that we get here in the UK for free just aren't enough. They literally won't cut it. So you're gonna have to expect to be paying a little bit extra to get the jabs. If you're going on a long distance trek and you're planning on filtering water, you're gonna need typhoid, diphtheria, you're gonna need to take the cholera vaccine, which is like a drink that you take. It's like comes in like a little vial, uh, which is really weird. Uh, you're also gonna need to get hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Uh, a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia, don't have a very high rate of malaria. It is out there, but it's not as common as dengue fever. And for dengue fever, there actually isn't a vaccine or a tablet that you can take. So for Indonesia, I don't use malaria tablets. Uh, just cover up as best you can. That is the best solution for keeping those mosquitoes off. Uh, but what you've got to remember is that the sanitation in these countries is quite poor compared to our standards. It's not as bad as a lot of people think in most areas, but if you're going out hiking, you're gonna be on the trail for uh, multiple nights in a row. Uh, you're gonna be filtering water anyway, especially in the hot climate. Uh, there's a lot of farming going on, so there's a lot of pastures, a lot of cows. Uh, there's a lot of diseases out there and the warm climates, infection is rife. So make sure you get the right filter and the right jabs. Let your GP or the people in boots that you speak to uh, know about the type of places that you're going and let them know that you're gonna be filtering water because they'll be able to advise you on what ones you need to get. As trekkers, we like to walk, but also a lot of people like running. And the big problem with Southeast Asia is there's a lot of feral dogs around and if they see someone running the likelihood of it is that you're going to get chased and a lot of runners out in these countries do actually get bitten very very frequently by rabid dogs. I would say rabies is an absolute essential uh, vaccine to get before you go traveling to any country in Southeast Asia or in Africa or South America uh, but it's not one of the free ones and it's probably one of the most expensive. I think one single jab is about 60 quid right now here in the UK uh, and you have to get three of them a week uh, in concession of each other. So getting all the jabs, the prices do rack up, but it's definitely worth it. And for your peace of mind, uh, when I went traveling last year, I didn't know which countries I was gonna be in. I didn't know where I was gonna be hiking. Uh, and I didn't know how long I was gonna be going for. So I just got the entire full whack of jabs that I could get. Any possible travel vaccine that I could get, uh, I spent 
spent my money on. For South America, especially countries like Brazil, I do know that you need a yellow fever card to either enter or leave the country. I think you might be able to enter the country without one, but to leave, you have to have the yellow card with you. But it's definitely one to think about, especially if you don't know whereabouts you're going to be hiking in South America. I do have a yellow card because I got my jab uh, for yellow fever, but I think I need a booster within a year's time. Okay, folks, campfire question. What is the one most important bit of research that you do before hiking in a new country and why? Okay, everybody, thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, then hit that thumbs up. Do be sure to watch either of the videos to my site here. Also, if you're new here and you haven't done so already, do consider subscribing for more videos just like this one, and I'll see you guys in the next one.